I just feel like I can make a whole video of just looking at this hibiscus plant. I have a bunch of these exact same kind. I bought a bunch of bare roots, potted them up beginning of last year. But wow. This one is really the, f the flashiest one. They all look pretty good. But I came in my driveway today and it was, it was all closed up when I left this morning. I had appointments and I saw it and was like, wow. Even with all the spent blooms, I mean, there's, it's still just covered in ones that I haven't opened yet. It's incredible. That's a proven winter's plant. It's called Perfect Storm, and it is majestic. Beautiful hibiscus. I didn't actually save anything from it last year because I don't know, as far as like making hibiscus tea, what is the best. I need to look into it. I mean, I'm sure it's like many things, like the ornamental versions are still usable, but a lot of times they're not necessarily like the best for the use of medicinal purposes. Like I think there are a lot of calendulas, for example, that are really showy and lovely, but the Rosina calendula is the best for medicinal purposes because of its high resin content. And I'm wondering if there may be something like that with hibis hibiscus or if they all are kind of similar. Hey horses. I was gonna try to hook this up one-handed. It's not gonna work. One of the things that I really love about the garden is the nature of things like peaking and having their kind of like time to shine. For instance, like that hibiscus is glorious. They're all glorious, but that particular hibiscus plant is just covered and it'll peak. I mean, it'll be the most majestic thing in the garden for a week and then it'll be something else. For whatever reason, I just like that. I like that dynamic. <laughs> my green stock with my micro dwarf tomatoes is looking pretty good. I'm gonna water it. We got rain last night, which I was really thankful because the garden was fairly dry and it rained for a while yesterday evening. But I usually like to come out and give my containers water even still, even though the garden was thoroughly rained on just because I never know how much rain a container actually got. The whole like time to shine thing is the reason why I always encourage you guys to take photos of your garden and to do like photo journaling, which is not fancy. You don't have to print things out. If you want to, you can, but just keeping a record of photos, I mean, what a great way to use the technology of our cell phones, which you probably often have on you. Uh, and when you take a photo, it automatically gives you the date. Uh, there on the picture and that to me is such a cool way to keep up with when things did Their peak time when was their time to shine and I don't know It's crazy because I look back on the photos that I was taking when all my irises were blooming And I was just blown away by them and the rest of the garden feels downright bare in those pictures But the irises were awesome. I want to show you guys this. We had a bunch of started plants obviously these were actually where we were separating plants out and there were just some little extras and we dumped out other pots we dumped out other things and we were using this pool we poured some potting soil in here and we're literally just using it to pot other things but these plants ended up in here a lot of them were not even planted they were literally just laid like but they started to grow and eventually I saw their efforts and just started to water it. So this pool, like look at this, this is a tomato plant and it's literally, it was just laid on here and it started growing. These are clovers, that's weed. Mostly this is peppers, like these are fish peppers, they're variegated. I don't know what this one is. This is sweet alyssum, that's a little tomato plant. These are pepper plants. And now I'm interested, now I'm invested. Like. They're growing, they have a will to live. Anytime something has a will to live, I'll, I'll get behind it. So I just started watering it. And of course they're in here in the greenhouse, which has the shade cloth on now. I've done content in the past about kitty pool gardens, which if you were gonna put this outside, it would need holes in the bottom. This one doesn't have holes in the bottom. 
uh, so you, you wouldn't put it outside because it wouldn't drain well. But in here, you know, you just water it and don't overwater it, and it's fine. I'm curious to see if I get to harvest anything out of this unintentional little garden growing in my greenhouse. It actually should work pretty well in there. Kitty pool gardens work though. The main drawback with a kitty pool garden is their propensity to dry out fast. That's kind of the case with any container when it's 90 Fahrenheit, 32 Celsius every day or over, containers are just gonna get dry quickly. So when I talk about watering, like I water my tomato plants like maybe every third day, less if it rains. I don't water the main garden just constantly. The way I gauge it is I'll put my finger in the soil and I don't mind the like top inch of the soil being dry. And since we do use a lot of mulch, that helps retain moisture, but if it's dry beyond I say an inch, I go to my knuckle, so that's that's probably about an inch uh, or a little bit more. But if it's dry past my, my knuckle, I then will water the garden. The thing is, is that like the main garden being mulched can go a few days. Containers, when it's this hot, a lot of them really need to be watered every day or every other day, they just dry out faster. If you feel like you're watering like crazy though and your garden is not mulched, I would really look into that. Putting some material leaves that you rake up from the wood, broken down wood chips that have been able to sit for at least a year if you got mulch, like a lot of municipalities have mulch. Um, I use straw or hay, but you do need to make sure that it's not been sprayed with any sort of like broadleaf herbicide. You have to ask a lot of questions if you're gonna use straw or hay. I used to use it willy-nilly, just go to the farm store and get it wherever it was and get the cheap straw. Now that the whole spraying issue has become more prevalent, I'm way more cautious. With hay mulch, um, hay mulch sprouts grass. I get a lot of questions about this because people will say, I saw, see people mulch with hay and now I've got a bunch of grass growing in my garden. Um, usually you will get a flush of grass whenever you use hay mulch and you pull it out the first time and then it pretty much stops. Like all the seeds come up and you can pull them. They're not deeply rooted, they're just leak rooted in the mulch. So one good weeding of it and you won't have to deal with it again. But if you don't wanna deal with that, finding straw can help or using one of those other things. All of that to say, mulching is really important when it's hot outside. When it's the height of summer and the sun is just coming down on your garden, it will really bake uncovered soil. Right now, I have some places that don't have hay or straw, but they do have a thick layer of compost on top, and I even wanna get those covered because compost, whereas that does work as mulch in some places where it's really hot like it is here, keeping the, cover, the ground covered, it just makes for much healthier soil. Not much living can sit out in the sun. Uh, in the full sun all day. <laughs> all the animals spend most of the day in the shade under trees and stuff like that because it is hot. I have to mend my little hog. He lost an ear. Probably a kid playing in the garden. This thing's really old. My mom gave this to me a long time ago. But look at the hen and chick in it. Isn't it doing lovely? I stuck just a couple of, of these plants in there and they've multiplied a lot already. Oh, hi zucchini. I feel like I've not even finished planting my garden and we're already needing to start talking about the fall garden. I saw something interesting today online saying that if your thyme is flowering, to take the flowers off and you're, you'll get more leaves of the thyme in the fall than you would if you left the flowers on. This is actually lemon thyme and it is so lovely. If you Can we actually just talk about herbs for a minute? I feel like herbs are incredibly unsung in the gardening world. I think that they almost get treated, zucchini is literally under, she's sitting under my butt right now. I'm squatted down and <laughs> she's just decided that this is great, this is a great opportunity for us to get really comfortable with one another. Oh, zucchini. <laughs> okay, she lined up. <laughs> She's like rubbing all over me. <laughs> okay, herbs. I really, I think these get treated as like beginner gardener things or the things that people grow when they don't have space to grow real food. I, I hear them talked about like that. Oh, I just have a little herb garden. I just started. I just have herbs on a windowsill. I think herbs are one of the best things that you can grow in your garden to save money. Granted, a lot of people do not buy fresh herbs at the grocery store. If you do, it's a no-brainer. If you do, if you are currently buying those blister packs of herbs that are three or four dollars each, you should be growing herbs. You can go buy a plant in the nursery, the garden section, 
for the same amount of money you can buy a little package. Herbs are so luxurious to me. They, they take food to such the next level. And if you have, um, here's one. This is gonna hit some of y'all. You're gonna be like, oh dang, I feel attacked. I'm not attacking you, but I'm empowering you. Some of you have herbs growing in your garden and you're not putting them on your food. <laughs> You're not going and picking them and using them. I understand sometimes it's inconvenient. One thing I like to do is when I'm thinking about it, I'll come out and I'll harvest like a bunch of this time, more than I need for one meal. If I'm coming out to get it for a meal, I'll grab a whole handful, tie it in a bundle and just hang it up in my kitchen. So that next time that I need a little bit of it, I don't have to walk all the way out here if I don't want to. Just start harvesting your herbs. When you're pruning stuff, when you're pruning your basil, when you're pruning thyme and oregano and these things back, just take a little extra off, tie it. You don't have to put it in a dehydrator. You don't have to do it in the oven. Just tie a little string around it, put a tack on the wall in your pantry or something like that and hang it up on there where it can dry. And then when it's fully dry, put it in a little jar. And then you've got herbs that you grew. And herbs are great on everything. Don't be intimidated to use fresh herbs. In, in fact, when you start using them, you understand how wonderful they are and then you'll use them a lot more so if you're like roasting potatoes for instance come get a handful of thyme way more than this i'm going to use this as an example of what to do but like a handful we're not shy with herbs um, and you're going to take it and just strip it off just like this and you're going to take these these tiny little thyme leaves and sprinkle them all over your potatoes salt like good chunky salt some fresh cracked pepper olive oil all those herbs on them put those cut up potatoes in a 400 degree oven olive oil is good if you can get your hands on some like lard or some duck fat that makes the best potatoes tallow um, some sort of animal fat that makes really crispy potatoes and put those in a 400 degree oven like I don't know 25 or 30 minutes it depends on how big you cut the pieces obviously until they're nice and fork tender and you will never want to cook potatoes again without putting herbs on them zucchini you just love attention, don't you, girl? Zucchini came from our friends over at Big Bear Homestead, Robin and Jason, and their two girls, Carol and Ladessa. They live a couple hours away from us here. We've been friends for a long time before we moved to this side of the country. And they gave her lots of loving before she came here. So my other barn cats are like relatively wild. They kind of do their own thing. They come and see us occasionally. But Zucchini landed herself the role of garden cat because she loves attention. <laughs> Isn't that right? You want to say hi to Carol and Dessa? Say thanks for making me a lover. <laughs> Having a little garden buddy does bring me a lot of joy. Oh, getting some notable tomatoes over here on this row. I'm really hoping the shade cloth gets in soon. I think it was like a six week out order because obviously a lot of times those things are custom. I keep telling myself like it's fine. There's always next year. I know y'all have heard me say that before. This guy's coming off. Look at that. That's the funkiest tomato. Look at that cat facing and blossom end rot. Double whammy. It doesn't even know where the end is to rot. <laughs> I pulled it off. We don't need to be expending energy trying to make that something ripe. I want to tell you guys some thoughts I have about this space, but I'm going to finish my thought on herbs so that we're not chasing squirrels here or chasing hummingbirds, as I like to say. All right, into this garden. Oh. There's some commotion going on over here in the herd. I don't know what was happening. Does anybody else narrate their animal's drama? Because I do. I just got really hasty and I harvested this little ear of corn. It wasn't ready. <laughs> so much for not chasing <laughs> rabbit trails. <laughs> Let's go in the shade. Oh, volunteer. That looks like a watermelon, maybe? Some sort of melon. Welcome to the party. You eager little guy. Whoa. Hello, strawberries. Other herb ideas. One of my favorite ways to use a lot of herbs from the garden, and you can do this with really whatever it is that you like. Oregano, thyme, basil. Um, I don't have as many in my garden now as I used to because we were getting the raised bed garden going over last winter and I will get more herbs in there that will be perennial and keep coming back. Of course, I've got a lot of mint. I have pineapple sage, regular sage, rosemary, all of those. Marjoram's another one. Tarragon's a good herb. Uh, but grab a, you know, a handful of herbs. For me, it's usually thyme, oregano, rosemary, and maybe basil. And just chop them up. And I'm talking like... 
I'll sometimes use like at least half a cup or even a whole cup of chopped up fresh herbs. So like I'll take roughly like a stick of butter that softened and mix that cup of chopped herbs up in the butter. And then take a chicken, a whole chicken, and take that butter, that herb butter, and just slide it underneath the skin. Something I learned from my friend Taylor. She's the one who brought us the lovely basil tea. And I had previously just like sprinkled herbs on top of the skin, but a lot of times they get burnt whenever you're cooking the chicken. But by putting it in the butter under the skin and then you roast that chicken and the butter melts and it's super herb infused, it makes your meat so flavorful, the herbs don't burn and it is, it's really, really good. I think a lot of people are freaked out at the idea of using fresh herbs because they just haven't. And if you've only ever used dried seasonings before, make some dried seasonings. Like I was saying, grab some extra and hang them up to dry until you feel more comfortable and find ways that you can use them fresh. I promise you, if you will just get over the leap and start using them, you will be so hooked. If ever, like let's say I'm traveling, visiting somebody, I'm gonna cook for them and I have to go to the store. If I ever have to buy if I have to purchase herbs, dried herbs at the store, I am just belligerent about it. I am like, $5 for this tiny jar? Because they're so prolific and abundant in a garden that the idea of paying that much for them becomes nuts. But the idea of cooking without them is even more reprehensible, so. All right, I'm sitting in here because it's kind of shaded with the shade cloth, it's very hot outside. So corn, when it's ready the ends the silk's brown and then the ear which is it grows kind of upright and it starts to kind of tilt out away from the main stalk as it ripens and then eventually it kind of like breaks away more and it like hangs down and this one was tilting outward more than the others and the silks were kind of brown and i didn't think that it would be ready but i got hasty because i was excited I am excited to see the state of this. This is golden bantam sweet corn, and it's starting to turn yellow, but it's not quite there yet. It's probably close. I mean, this probably will be ripe in a couple of days. Mmm. Definitely not ready, but so stinking good. The kernels are still just um, a little underdeveloped, but they're starting to get some juice in the end. So sweet. So corn starts converting its sugars to starch like almost immediately after being picked the sweetest corn you will ever eat is when you eat it as soon as you can after it comes off the plant and if you're getting it to process like if you're buying it local if, you, if you've got somebody that sets up a stand if you live in a place where corn grows um, and you can buy like a big bag or whatever you want to process it right away because this i think the sooner you get it frozen or the sooner you get it canned the sweeter it's going to be really fresh corn is so good that you literally just have to barely cook it and put some butter on it i mean this is super sweet it will be a lot better in another week or so but this right here sitting in this greenhouse eating this raw corn is really like one of the reasons i garden <laughs> honestly this is in the, the herbs <laughs> so all of these were starting to yellow and fill up but all these on the end are still not developed so another week or so we should have corn so likely what I'll do with this is, I mean, just take it, shuck it, and do like a real fast grill, which will concentrate the sugars, just like butter and salt. And that's it, and it's so good. Another thing I've been doing with herbs lately is infusing other things with them. So I mentioned recently that I made strawberry basil ice cream by steeping basil leaves in the cream and then straining them out and taking that basil infused cream and making ice cream, making strawberry ice cream with it. Recently, I cut up a bunch of peaches because I had a bunch of local peaches and simmered them with a lot of thyme in them and I just kept them as whole. I didn't like break the leaves off. I just kept them all on the branches so that I could pick it out um, and then made a brown butter peach cobbler with those thyme infused peaches. <laughs> I made it gluten free so I could taste it and I would have ate the whole pan if I'd known it wouldn't make my skin break out real bad the next day. So I took it to the church potluck, <laughs> shared it with everybody else. See, everything has its time to shine. These sunflowers were the showstopper last week and now they're making seeds which is just as important but maybe slightly less impressive looking. 
Zinnias are good for a good long show. They stay impressive for a while. This is one of my favorite zinnias. This is a queen lime pink heart zinnia, or ro blush heart maybe is what they call it, but it's one of the queen lime with the pink in the middle. That's so pretty. Look at this beautiful wild mess. I can't walk in there right now because I don't have boots on. And I live where snakes can kill you. I can go around it, <laughs> but I'm not going in it. I'm gonna sit over here and talk to you about that middle section area in my garden, which I have been growing potatoes in the last couple of seasons. We've done regular potatoes and sweet potatoes, but I've been thinking a lot lately with the high tunnels, with the, the raised bed space, and then we kind of started this space across the driveway, which we're doing all this random stuff in this year, but I don't know what we'll do next time. I'm actually thinking of changing that middle space into something a little more permanent, um, like berries or something perennial that can be there, maybe even putting in a couple of fig trees trees and um, heavily mulching it with wood chips and just creating a more semi-permanent space that's not going to be so switched out seasonally. And then eventually being able to use the space that I'm standing in front of that's our contour garden to grow things like potatoes and sweet potatoes that are more sprawl. The reason being that I have been in expand mode since we moved here. We'll expand. We can make the bark garden bigger. We can fit on all these things. And like this year, I mean, we are swimming in food without even having what we have fully planted. And without a plan of marketing, I like having all the spaces. I like having the option to grow a whole lot of food, especially if there were a situation when it was necessary. I like having prepared soil. I like having seeds. I like having the capacity to grow a lot of food. But I'm thinking about putting something more permanent in that middle section and then putting the things that need to be tilled over here off the side um, because I kind of feel like okay this is enough like this is enough to keep up with I work the garden I've got will here but this is way more garden than I could possibly keep up with on my own and that will could even keep up with us on his own you know like this is not a one-person garden and I'm looking at like us not getting the high tunnel planted the the cut flower tunnel planted this year and the things I wanted to do that we didn't get to which is fine that's that's good it's okay to have things on your list you don't get to one season the beauty of gardening we're gonna do it again next time uh, but I kind of am like you know what why like why keep expanding why keep stretching thin I kind of feel like I want to rein it in a little bit I know you guys are like who are you where's Jess could just be July talking you know like <laughs> downsizing always sounds good in July <laughs> but uh, but seriously I, I think that as far as like having a space because right now we're tilling that middle space because uh, potatoes you know I mean you're digging them up anyway so we keep retilling and I was like wouldn't it make sense to have the tilled space across the driveway and then instead of turning this into like a necessarily like a constantly changing growing space I'd like to do something a little more static and a little more permanent with some more structure because I think it's going to make the beauty of this more cohesive and also this is just enough space two high tunnels this in ground that garden I mean we can grow pretty much everything there the only reason I would even till this for potatoes is just because you have to disturb the ground for potatoes and I'd like to do the disturbing somewhere else because I like that we're doing this without tilling so what do you think throw your opinions at me share your thoughts with me uh, so many good ideas come from you guys you give me so much inspiration and I think that maybe like berry bushes like rows of berry bushes potentially even like a, a medicinal herb garden a more extensive perennial herb garden I'm thinking some spaces that can be a little more permanent not constantly shifting because what's happening is and this I know it's minor but like this garden's peaking this garden's peaking and my massive space in the middle is in flux because it's constantly changing and our goal for next year is to get the fences and the gates and all of the different stuff up to really kind of complete this and i really just think something more permanent in here is going to help the flow of this and then if we want to till to do potatoes or sweet potatoes we can do it across pasture berries herbs more roses what do you what are your thoughts throw it at me and for good measure one more time <laughs>
hibiscus appreciation. Thank you guys for hanging out with me today and all the days you do. I bless you until next time.